Hi, everyone. Sorry, we're running a little bit late today. I'll just give a second for everyone to get loaded in here. Um, because many of you will be repeat attendees, I will start the intro whilst you're all coming in. Welcome to the DARIA series. The DARIA series is the Drug and Alcohol Research and Innovation Active Learning Network. It's a virtual weekly seminar program delivered by St. Vincent's Hospital Sydney Alcohol and Drug Service and the National Center for Clinical Research on Emerging Drugs and CRED in collaboration with Southern New South Wales Local Health District, Murrumbidgee Local Health District, Far West New South Wales Local Health District and Western New South Wales Local Health District. Of course, we are at the moment in this state going through a lot of flooding um, and a lot of scary times for a lot of you in those districts. So um, sending you all of our thoughts today um, and glad you could join us um, given those circumstances. So the aim of this series is to, to promote innovative practice and share learnings and new ideas amongst clinicians and clinical researchers working in the field of methamphetamine, emerging drugs and other areas of alcohol and drug health. So I'd like to start today's session by acknowledging and paying our respect to the traditional custodians of the lands and waters of Australia and all First Nations elders, past, present, and emerging, especially those who are joining us today. We respectfully acknowledge the traditional custodians and their continuing cultural, spiritual customs and practices. I would like to welcome our speaker for this week's Daria session. Dr. Roman Pillay graduated from ANU Medical School and prior to this conducted research in immunology, specifically characterizing immune responses and boosting the BCG vaccine for TB. He's currently a basic physician trainee at St. Vincent's Hospital in Sydney on the drug and alcohol team. One of his supervisors at this moment is Dr. Chris Tremonti, who co-chairs this um, series with me. Also, before we get started, just a reminder that there will be a recording available after the session that's freely available and ready for you to share with colleagues, peers, or consumers that you feel may be interested. You'll find that and all previous ones on the NCRED website. And without further ado, I will hand over to you, Dr. Play. All right, thank you, Crystal. And thanks for the opportunity to speak. Um, so today I'll be pre presenting a publication um, which was published in JAMA Psychiatry in um, last month. And that's a uh, percentage of heavy drinking days following psilocybin assisted psychotherapy versus placebo in the treatment of adult patients with alcohol use disorder and this was a randomized clinical trial. So the background to this is that um, there's been a growing interest in psychedelics for uh, the treatment of psychiatric illnesses and substance use disorders recently. And there's been a longstanding history of research with these drugs um, and specifically in 19, between 1996 uh, sorry, 1966 and 1971, there were uh, some randomized clinical trials which showed that um, LSD demonstrated um, so remission in alcohol use disorder compared to other drugs. And so this study is the first to show um, some positive results with psilocybin. So what is psilocybin? It's um, a compound that is naturally produced by um, magic mushrooms, and it shares a similar structure to serotonin, a neurotransmitter. Um, the mechanism of action is not quite clear, but it is known to bind to serotonin receptors in um, postsynaptic neurons in the brain. And um, as you can see here, it's converted to psilocin and then binds to the receptor, and that has downstream effects um, in intracellular signaling, gene expression, and uh, ultimately acts to um, enhance neuroplasticity and then have effects on cognition and behavior. So in this study, they um, recruited patients between March 2014 and 2015 at the University of New Mexico and between 2015 and 2020 at um, New York University. And that was using adv advertisements in local media. They chose patients between the age of 25 to 65 who had a diagnosis of alcohol dependence uh, via the DSM-IV criteria. They had to have 
at least four heavy drinking days during the, the 30 days prior to screening, defined as five or more drinks in a day for a male or four drinks or more for a, a female. Um, they excluded any participants who had any major psychiatric or drug use disorders, any hallucinogen use um, in the past year or more than 25 times in their lifetime, any medical conditions that contra contraindicated either of these study medications, such as cardiac conditions, and um, any medications that they were on which would interact um, and also any if they were already on treatment for alcohol use disorder. So the participants were assessed at screening at baseline at week zero and then weeks four, five, eight, nine, 12, 24, and 36. They were assigned into two groups in a even spread. So first group to either receive psilocybin and the second group to receive diphenhydramine and that's the control drug they use which is a sedating antihistamine and they were administered in two eight-hour sessions at weeks four and week eight. The participants also were offered 12 psychotherapy sessions from two therapists including a psychiatrist and also motivational interview and cognitive behavioral therapy throughout the study. And they were randomized um, by a pharmacist at each site and all of the study staff and investigators were blinded to the drugs as well as the participants. So the doses they used um, for the first session were lower than the second. So for the first, it was for psilocybin, 25 milligrams per 70 kilos. And for the control drug, it was 50 milligrams. And then to choose the dose of drug for the second session, they um, used a Pank Richards Mystical Experience questionnaire, which um, if was high, indicated um, a very strong subjective experience. Um, and if so, they were given 40 milligrams per 70 kilos, uh, uh, sorry, 30 milligrams per 70 kilos in the second session. But if um, they didn't, have such an intense subjective experience, they were given a high dose of 40 milligrams for 70 kilos. Um, but there was no alteration to the second dose of uh, diphenhydramine, which was 100 milligrams. Um, so they gave the medication at 9 a.m. And then after that, the participants were um, in a room with therapists for eight hours, but allowed to go out for bathroom breaks. Um, after the, um, after the session, they were given, uh, an, another questionnaire to a question, a MEC questionnaire, which, um, uh, basically, um, as I explained, had different, um, questions, which, uh, tried to gauge their subjective experience, such as feelings of sacredness or feelings of, um, disruption to the perception of time. Um, and then they measured uh, drinking outcomes over the weeks from five to 32. The, the second, uh, so the, the main outcome they looked at was the percentage of heavy drinking days from the weeks um, five to 32. And then the secondary outcomes were uh, percentage of drinking days, um, the mean drinks per day, and then uh, whether they had complete abstinence or a lack of heavy drinking days or a reduction in the WHO risk level. They also looked at um, ethyl glucuronide um, concentrations or ETG, and that's a biomarker for abstinence at week 24. And then they also um, had another scoring system which looked at uh, the short index of problems which looked at um, drinking related problems at 12 weeks, 12, 24, and 36. Um, so to assess safety, they looked at various factors such as blood pressure and heart rate um, in 30 to 60 minute intervals during the first six hours, um, recorded any adverse events at the post-screening assessment. And they were also um, 
they also asked participants and therapists to guess what medication they were using um, and used a hundred point visual scale to assess this. A hundred being absolute certainty, zero being unsure. So the results of this show that 400, 569 participants were screened initially. Um, 397 of those were excluded. And then they ended up with 95, which they randomized to two even groups. Um, most of those patients went on to complete the entire study. So the characteristics of the patients uh, were fairly evenly distributed between the two groups. Um, so the mean age was around 45 years old. There was um, an e e even number of males and females and a spread of ethnicities. There was, um, so prior to, at screening, um, the percentage of drinking days was about 75% um, the mean between the two groups. Um, and the percentage of heavy drinking days was about 50% at screening. Um, and interestingly, um, the drinks per drinking day was around six to seven. So I'm not sure if that's in line with other studies, but it, it may be a little bit less than what's reported or what has been seen in other alcohol use disorder studies. Um, and so the treatment exposure and retention. So um, participants treated with psilocybin and the control drug um, completed most of their, non their therapy sessions um, and data was obtained for most of the months in the eight month follow-up period. However, the um, biomarker ETG results were only available for 50 of the 93 participants um, due to missing data, insufficient samples and missed visits. Um, 14 or 28% reported total abstinence on the, um, on the, the follow-up scoring. Um, and of all of those people that reported abstinence, that ETG results were available, they were all negative, which um, supports the validity of it. Um, so interesting, or well, not surprisingly, um, most of the participants co correctly guessed what drug they were um, being administered. So 93.6% in the first session and 94% in the second session. And also the, the therapists who were in the room with them could also guess the treatment in both sessions. In terms of acute effects, um, so the, the, what the patients administered psilocybin had increased systolic and diastolic blood pressures. So the patients, um, the psilocybin group is in the purple line, and you can see the systolic pressures were much higher than um, in the control group, um, but this tended to wane after 360 minutes. Um, and they said no, no participants needed treatment for this. Um, and the subjective effects of the drug were um, in the psilocybin group, a high average intensity of experiences compared to the control group. Looking at the efficacy, so at screening in the control group, the percentage of heavy drinking days was 48%, whereas in the psilocybin group was 56%. Um, at week four, which is the week where they first received the drug, they had the participants had already cut down or underreported how much they were drinking. Um, so there was a significant reduction compared to at screening. But then at follow up, the percentage of heavy drinking days was much lower in the psilocybin group, 9.71 versus 23.57% in the control group. There was also um, 
lower percent of drinking days in the psilocybin group compared to the control group and also lower number of drinks per day um, in the psilocybin group versus the control control group. And also the percent of, so you can, this looks at the percentage of heavy drinking days over time. The, the purple is the, uh, sorry, the, I think that's a yellow or a brown is the control group and the psilocybin is in blue. So at the first arrow up here points to the first dose administered and the second arrow is the second dose administered. And on the x-axis is the, the each month um, up to 36 weeks and y-axis is percentage of heavy drinking days. So as similar as um, depicted in the earlier table at screening, there was a higher percentage of drinking days, but then by week four, um, there has, was already a drop in drinking in preparation for the study. Um, and then over time, the psilocybin group seemed to have less percentage of heavy drinking days. But as it approached week 36, the lines seemed to come closer together. Um, and it's really unknown if the effect is long lasting or not. Um, and the same can be seen for percentage of drinking days and drinks per day. Um, and so this looks at um, abstinence and in the psilocybin group um, at weeks five to 36, they report uh, there's no real significant difference between the two groups, um, but at weeks 33 to 36, they report almost double the chance of abstinence compared to the control group. Um, and a similar kind of uh, trend happens with no heavy drinking, um, as well as the risk uh, WHO risk level. And that's basically three, three categories which um, categorized. Uh, so low level is defined as zero to 40 grams of alcohol per day, moderate 40 to 60, and high level 60 to 100 grams. In terms of safety, um, there were 204 adverse events reported, um, 119 in the psilocybin group, 85 in the control group. Um, only three adverse repent, um, events were reported and all of which were in the control group, um, two of which uh, participants were uh, admitted to hospital for suicidal ideation in the context of alcohol intoxication and one was um, hospitalized for a Mallory waist hair due to vomiting during um, an in uh, being intoxicated. Um, common effects in the first 48 hours were anxiety and nausea, um, in, more so in the psilocybin group. Um, and two uh, participants had to receive diazepam 10 milligrams for anxiety during their second session. Um, they reported no persistent disturbances of uh, suggestive of psychosis or um, uh, hallucinogen, hallucinogen persisting perception disorder. So the limitations of this study is firstly, a huge factor is a blind, the blinding was unable to be maintained. So it's the subjective experiences of the patients are un, uh, unable to be accounted for. Um, the validity of the reporting wasn't um, able to be um, fully elucidated with, with only 53% of patients having ETG samples um, available. Um, and potentially this is looking looking at a population with a lower um, drinking intensity than what has been um, investigated in other alcohol use disorder trials. And then also the long-term effects of if there is an effect there is unknown. 
So in this study, psilocybin um, was associated with improved drinking outcomes after 32 weeks of observation, uh, but this must be taken with a grain of salt given that blinding is unable to be maintained. Um, but it, in line with other studies, it, it, was, um, it was shown to be a fairly safe drug with um, only very mild adverse effects. So thank you. Thanks, Roman. Sorry. Uh, Chris Ramonti here. <laughs> Apologies that I missed you at the start and thank you for presenting that um, that journal and thanks to Christopher um, for kicking things off. Um, I wanted to, um, I guess, well, firstly ask, I mean, is there enough of a signal here, even in spite of the limitations that you think? There's obviously a lot of excitement about psilocybin and other um, uh, hallucinogenics for use in substance dependence. Do you think there's enough of a signal in this for people to get excited? I think there's definitely potential there. Um, there still was a clear difference between the two groups, um, although the numbers are still very small as well. I guess um, further studies would be good to, I guess, elucidate that further. But How much money do you think these people have? <laughs> probably not much, I'm guessing. Um, what was I going to say? I can't help but notice as well, there's one concern that people, well, that um, has been mentioned. I mean, obviously, there's, there's, lot, there's lots of different aspects to, to hallucinogenics and substance use dependence. But one that people seem to be getting a little, I have noticed once or twice come up is that this could become uh, very much a wealthy person's treatment. So I noticed on the one of your slides, if you don't mind going back, was the median income sort oh, yeah. of $100,000? Uh, is that correct? Right? That is correct. Krista's got her hand up as well. So sorry, sorry, Krista, I'll, I'll let you. Oh my jump. God, I love you pointing that out. I didn't notice that on this slide. Wow. Yeah, I didn't notice that. Yeah. It's so true though, especially because it is um, psilocybin and a lot of other classical psychedelics have a real history within indigenous and first nations peoples all around the world. And yet they're constantly and consistently underrepresented in any current <laughs> <laughs> research or literature mm. and I just think it's really really shocking um which is yeah going again to to sort of how we represent people in clinical research or trials and yeah it's an interesting thing started building off that thought about the income here well I mean I'm not again and seeing as you mentioned it I mean you jump down a couple of couple of rows um and you can see that there's now I, I off the top of my head I don't know what the percentage of people uh, who identify as Native American um, is in America, um, nor do I know whether or not they're more overrepresented for alcohol use disorder. But uh, yeah, there was only one person over, it, yeah, one person in total um, out of the um, the ninety five. So I don't know. I mean, it is small numbers. So I mean, you know. I don't know how much how representative that is, but yeah, it does sort of yeah. And the, these 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 you know treatments are very uh, they're very labor intensive from all reports. I'm not a I'm not a a psychologist that works with them, and I'm I don't pretend to even begin to be skilled in that. But I understand, and maybe there's somebody online that can share their experiences if they have them. But I understand they are very that it is very very labor intensive. And so again, this may skew towards something that's more for, yes, the, a, a, well, a wealthy person's treatment. Mm, yeah. And while we're waiting for someone to un unmute themselves or, or put <laughs> themselves on camera to, to address that, I was wondering, Roman, if you made, if you drew any conclusions or if there was anything that struck you about the diphenhydramine and, you know, diphenhydramine for anyone who's ever had it, 50 milligrams, I mean... I dare say, you know, you're not on 30 milligrams of psilocybin. And I just wonder what you think about the blinding effect or the placebo effect or the expectation effect or any of those kind of confounding things, whether you think that um, that these data, how, how does blinding work in a psychedelic study? 
Mm. Well, I haven't actually had that drug myself, <laughs> diphenhydramine, but um, I'm assuming it has no kind of hallucinogenic effects. No. Um, so, I mean, it would be pretty easy to guess if you're on that. Um, and uh, I think Chris was saying that it also um, compared to psilocybin, they have different pupillary effects, whereas uh, psilocybin, I think, dilates and um, and diphenhydramine constricts. Is that correct, Chris? I'm pretty sure that's right. Um, yeah. so I was also re I was reading on. that diphenhydramine is anticholinergic, which usually you'd get dilation, but um, potentially not um i'm not sure i'm what was i going to say i thought also a uh, diphenhydramine but do you actually need it like like you can just get it over the counter you can just get it over, yeah it's, it's so just you an can, antihistamine it's an antihistamine yeah. in it. so it's, with, it, it does have anticholinergic some, effects though. yeah it would definitely have those anticholinergic effects but not the classical psychedelic effects that you'd be expecting if you were enrolling in a study and and thought you were getting psilocybin so um mm. just yeah just a comment around that that yeah, idea so that... i guess if you if you know you're not getting psilocybin then you know not nothing is going to be effective and then you're probably less likely to have a positive response um and so... i guess uh, last week at Abside, I'm not sure if anyone at Abside ca caught Celia Morgan, who came out from the UK to discuss some of the work she's doing with psilocybin and, and alcohol use disorder. Um, and one of the things that she talked about that really piqued my interest was the the idea of set and setting, whereby in her clients, she was finding that participants appreciated the setting to be clinical she actually found that people were wanting a clinical setting, whereas traditionally in, in these studies, there's a lot of talk around the setting being non-clinical. So it's an interesting kind of additional confound as well, potentially. And I'm not sure if that, that played out. I'm not sure how they, they set this study up, but yeah, just another comment around some of the designs in these works. Um, so I, I just wanted to clarify about... Um... Uh, diphenhydramine. I mean, it is anticholinergic, so I wasn't aware of it. What, what does it constrict pupils? I, yeah, I, I thought it, it should. It should dilate pupils, as far as I know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Was there something in the paper that said that patients were sort of easily, easily, like it was easy to spot them? No, no, no. I thought that's oh, okay. what you you were saying the other day, but I may have misheard you. Oh, okay. Um, so I do, I do recall someone talking about pupils, but I don't remember. Mm. Anyway. Um, yeah, sorry. And, and Jekka is just saying, yes, it's Benadryl. Um, so easily, easily sourced over the counter as well. Um, well, sorry, yeah, not as well. It is that. So, yeah. Um, and, uh, was I going to say, so, I mean, did they, was there a specific question about, um, um, uh, was there a specific uh, point about patients sort of ask, being asked about what they thought they were on and if that was, that was, you know, uh, you know that, that, that sort of was, was obvious, like, so the patients, like, so 90% of patients knew what they were taking or did they ask about that? Yeah, yeah. So, um, sorry, I must have missed that Yeah, one. that's right. So, yeah, they, most of them co correctly guessed what they were on, so um in both sessions and 93.6 in the first 94.7 in the second okay so most most people kind of knew, yeah. knew what they were doing which kind of i guess yeah as you pointed out kind of underlined yeah. things a little bit as well um okay well anyway um sorry i'm waffling on a bit so please if people have got questions please um please do uh, sing out. Um, we've also had a comment from Nadine. Uh, Diphenhydrin caused meiosis at all luminance levels. Aha. Uh -huh. Ah, so this was in a, and she's referenced a uh, relationship between sedation and pupillary function comparison of diazepam and diphenhydramine. So that caused meiosis. Right, uh, constriction. At, mm, 
Okay. So I, I, I always assumed, um, apologies um, to those uh, listening that um, uh, diphenhydramine, because of its anticholinergic properties, would have caused pupillary dilation. But again, this is going to be another reason why it would have been fairly obvious to everybody that um, that, uh, that that which medication they were taking. Um, all righty. Um, um, does if anybody else has any questions, please um, do jump in. Um, there was a also an interesting point on there about just um, autonomic changes. Um, there was a. Um, can you just do you mind just going back to the slide on that, um, Roman? So so quite sort of so systolic blood pressure um, uh, and heart rate. But it uh, but it all settled down. Is that is that what we're to take That's from right. all yeah. of this? Yeah. Okay. Without so. treatment. Yeah. Okay. So uh, it's quite. It's yeah, again. I mean, it, if it's sort of going to be something that's going to give it give the game away in any yeah, other exactly. studies as well. Um, if if you just check their blood pressure at the hour mark, um, you can kind of. Yeah, get a pretty good semblance if it's gone screamingly high. Well, you know, um, you know, you know what you've got a fairly good idea as to what's happened. Um, another question from Nadine: How clinically meaningful are the results? Modest changes in a group with low level use men could explain by expectancy. Um, yeah, I don't, did you want to? Did you want to talk to that, Roman? How clinically meaningful? I mean, I don't think we could probably use this study to give psilocybin at this point. Um, what, what was the, the, the remainder of the question? I guess, so do you, yeah, well, we, we have already kind of covered it a bit, how clinically meaningful are the results? So, I mean, like you've said, it's, it's low, and Nadine's also pointed out, it's a group with low level use at, at baseline. Um, mm. Potentially they were all expecting to get a change. They all knew kind of what they were getting um that said i mean and and you know the the results in the psilocybin group were good um it would be i think better if they'd done this in a group with perhaps more severe so even i mean even sort of more moderate uh, alcohol use disorder um and they have also left out people with other substance use disorders which is fine i mean they need to do that but I guess, um, you know, a lot of our patients have concomitant disease. So I guess it remains to be seen what will happen, especially as there's a lot of, in, a lot of um, data coming out around methamphetamine use as well. Um, okay. As um, well, if, um, and there's another comment here, um, which is not, sorry, not question, not uh, more a comment that, uh, Roman is on a day off. He worked 22 hours over the weekend. He's a champ. So uh, thanks, Roman, for um, I think I bailed you up to present on this a while ago. So apologies that um, no, that's all right. No that you've um, you've you've uh, but so go on and go and hit the beach if it stopped uh, stopped raining out there. But I imagine it hasn't. Uh, and I'm sure there'll be more chat about psilocybin uh, in the future because it's certainly something that's an increasingly um, of interest uh, and is featured in the media prominently and uh, our job as clinicians is to kind of sift through the literature uh, and temper expectations and certainly there's a lot of expectations around it at the moment and that's not to say we shouldn't be optimistic but um, uh, certainly we need to take everything take everything slowly and make sure that the the literature and evidence is there to back it up before we go rushing into treatments Alrighty, well, um, we're a little bit early, but um, that tends to be the case when we've got a journal. So please join me in thanking uh, Roman for today's presentation. Um, and uh, we'll be back uh, next Monday with another Daria session. Um, I, don't, I, I believe the week after will be the NCRED symposium. So that will be the last session before the NCRED symposium. Uh, in a couple of weeks time. So make sure you, you sign up. Uh, I, I'm happy to give that a quick little plug myself. So um, there's some really interesting uh, speakers for the NCRED Symposium on November the 7th. So 
um, please have a look at that. Even if you can only attend for a little bit during the day, there's lots of really interesting uh, talks, including people involved um, in this forum and who may be online today, and lots of uh, studies that will have um, that have been going on in the background and had involvement through St Vincent's and other sites. So um, please uh, sign up to that. Uh, but next week we'll be um, lucky enough to be joined by Dr James Blog, who's got a particular area in performance and imaging, imaging enhancing drugs or um, PEDS as they are known and uh, it's certainly um, an area of interest um, and there was some again some really good uh, work coming out of Melbourne down at APSAD for those who made to join that presentation uh, just around again issues of hypertension liver illness and so forth so I'm sure uh, Dr Bog will have more to talk about with that next week but until then um, thanks very much for joining and if there's nothing else we'll see you um, next week oh and um, yeah, no, that's, I'm um, sorry. Um, sorry, there was a, a link to the um, MCRED symposium. We'll try and post that, send that around as well so that people can get along to that. Thanks very much. Okay. Thank you.